Anglo-Scottish War of 1513 is not well known, certainly not in England, or indeed even in Scotland outside of the borders. Its culmination was the Battle of Flodden, a clash that deserves to be much better known than it is, if only because it is by far the biggest battle ever fought between England and Scotland, and in fact is quite possibly the largest battle ever fought in Britain. The Battle of Flodden was instigated by Henry VIII, he of the Six Wives. We have grown used to seeing Henry as an old, gouty, crotchety tyrant, but this was only true at the end of his life. His weight problems only started after a leg injury in 1536. The wound never fully healed, and Henry's extensive physical activities were much curtailed, but he continued to consume food at the same rate. The result is that his body weight ballooned, leading to all manner of health problems. But in 1513, Henry had only been on the throne for four years. He was 22 years old, athletic, vigorous and bold. And what do you do if you are a young, athletic, vigorous and bold English king in the early Renaissance? Why, you invade France, obviously. But Henry had a problem in pressing for war on the continent. If he was to lead an army against the old enemy, the French might reactivate the old alliance with Scotland, prompting a Scottish invasion while he was out of the country. As Henry prepared for war, the French stepped up their diplomatic efforts, believing that the threat of Scottish intervention would curb English aggression. Reports began to arrive in London that the French were supplying the Scots with large consignments of artillery, provisions and weaponry, specifically 18-foot pikes, at that time state-of-the-art weapons. They had also sent advisers, led by a Count d'Orsay, to teach the Scots how to use them. Nonetheless, King James IV of Scotland was initially wary about becoming involved. James IV was arguably the most capable and popular king that Scotland has ever had. He had in fact pretty much created the country by uniting the disparate Scottish clans. He ruled wisely and well. A true Renaissance man, James was interested in science and he was a patron of the arts. He had invigorated education in Scotland, encouraged shipbuilding and was particularly interested in military technology, especially cannon. Logically, James knew that war with England, in spite of being popular with its subjects, involved considerable risk for very little potential gain, at least for Scotland. Besides, Henry VIII was his brother-in-law, and the marriage to Margaret Tudor had brought much-needed peace on the borders. Unfortunately, James was also an idealist and a bit of a romantic. He had an eye for the ladies, and paid more than lip service to the more esoteric and impractical ideas of chivalry. This aspect of his character was ruthlessly exploited by the French. They promised him support after the English had been seen off for a rather impractical pre project he had to lead a great crusade against the Turks. But what really decided him on war was a personal letter from the Queen of France, which called him her knight and urged him to intervene on her behalf. A 25,000 crown subsidy helped too. In spite of the ominous news from Scotland, Henry remained determined on invading France so cunningly raised his army from the southern and midland counties, so that if the French did persuade the Scots to go to war, all the militia of North England would still be available to meet them. Having prepared, Henry duly set off and joined with his ally, the Holy Roman Emperor. However, the canny and outnumbered French were able to avoid a decisive clash, and Henry was denied the military glory he craved. He won only a few minor battles, the most notable of which was the famous Battle of the Spurs, so called because of the speed of the French withdrawal. Henry appointed his wife, Queen Catherine, as regent, but he named Thomas Howard, the Earl of Surrey, as Lieutenant General of the North. Howard was 70 years old, but he was very experienced and his mental capacities were quite unimpaired. He established storehouses in Newcastle and assembled a headquarters staff at Lambeth. By the middle of July it was clear that a Scottish incursion was imminent, and Howard headed north with his personal retinue. James had sent messengers all over Scotland ordering the feudal lords to raise their supporters and assemble at Edinburgh and Duns. According to his chivalric principles, James then wrote a letter to Henry declaring that he would invade England within a month unless Henry returned from his French campaign. True to his word, James led the largest army Scotland has ever raised southwards, crossing the border near Coldstream. The weather was appalling, the rain lashing down, but the undaunted Scots sent one detachment westwards to attack Wark Castle, while the main force, under James, moved to invest the great English border fort at Norham. 
Norham Castle had successfully repulsed the Scottish invasion in 1495, but even though it had since been reinforced, it was no match for James's heavy artillery. A short bombardment flattened the outer walls and a well-coordinated attack forced its surrender in only six days. James then moved his army southwards along the River Till, quickly capturing the last two English border forts at Ettel and Ford. When news of the Scottish invasion reached Henry in France, he wasted no time in raising his standard, the traditional signal to muster for the defence of the realm. With hand on his sword, he defied anyone who would evade his land and kill his subjects. The standard was then taken swiftly to London and delivered to the Earl of Surrey, with orders to raise an army and drive the Scots out. The experienced Earl was already in action. He sent messengers ahead to the leading nobles of North England, to the border wardens and to the mayors of the free towns. At each location the King's proclamation was solemnly read out and those who had signed indentures mustered. At the great Stanley family house at Alderley, Sir Edward Stanley assembled his retainers, each with the family emblem of an eagle's claw on their surcoats. At Hull, the Earl's son, the Lord High Admiral, landed his sailors and marines, where they marched in companies commanded by the captains of each ship. At Durham, the great standard of St Cuthbert, long used to lead English armies against the Scots, was taken from the cathedral. At Macclesfield, the messenger interrupted a meeting of the town council, and on hearing the King's proclamation, the Mayor, Christopher Savage, immediately adjourned and gathered the town's 300-strong levy. Surrey ordered his rapidly forming army to assemble at Pontefract, a reasonably central location near his major recruiting grounds. Here he organised them into the formations that they would use in the battle. The army was divided into two grand divisions, a vanguard and a rearguard. Each consisted of a large central body flanked by two smaller wings, so the army consisted of two large and four small divisions. The right wing of the vanguard was 3,000 strong and under the command of Surrey's younger son Edmund Howard. It consisted of an assortment of town levies, including those of Doncaster, Hull and the Macclesfield men led by their mayor, Christopher Savage. There were also 200 professional soldiers from the ship the Mary George. The main body of the vanguard was under the Admiral himself and consisted of 1,000 soldiers from the fleet, all clad in Tudor green and white, 2,000 retainers of the Bishop of Durham and an assortment of maybe 500 other Northumberland town levies. The bulk of the force, however, was over 6,000 troops from the more populous areas of South Yorkshire. This division also included the artillery train of 23 guns. The left wing of the vanguard was a small 2,000 strong formation under the command of Sir Marmaduke Constable and consisted of his retainers from the East Riding, some Percy retainers from Northumberland and about a 1,000 Lancashire men. The right wing of the rearguard division was commanded by Lord Dacre, the warden of the English West March. Half of his 4,000 men were border riders from Cumberland, Westmoreland and Northumberland. The rest were retainers of the Bishop of Ely. The main body of the rearguard was some 5,000 Yorkshire men under the command of the Earl of Surrey himself. The left wing was led by Sir Edward Stanley and consisted of some 3,000 of his retainers from Lancashire and Cheshire. Many of the English army rode to battle on small wiry ponies but they dismounted to fight. The only true cavalry was Dacre's borderers. The main weapon, equipping just over half of the English army, was the well-tried but increasingly old-fashioned longbow. The rest were armed with a simple but highly effective billhook. Dacre's border riders were armed with a collection of lances, swords and small crossbows called latches. Aside from the richest landowners who would have had plate armour, most of the English army were indifferently protected. Crude iron helmets called salets were usual, but most soldiers wore only felt or padded leather jackets, sometimes with small iron plate sewn in, to produce a shirt called a jack. Most of the 23 guns were small light falcons firing two pound shots, but there were also a few larger serpentines firing four or five pound shots. All of these soldiers needed to be paid and supplied, and Surrey was short of both cash and provisions. As soon as he could, therefore, Surrey moved north to intercept James, issuing a challenge to fight as he did. The Scottish king accepted, but refused the offer of a fair field. After investing the English border forts, he had stayed put. This may have been because of the terrible weather, which had already severely depleted his army by desertion and sickness. It may have been because James had been distracted by the presence of the Lady Heron of Ford Castle, who, it was alleged, had seduced the king into lethargy. Whether she really had been lying back and thinking of England, or James was held back by English drizzle, 
is impossible to say, but when he did move out of the area, it is noticeable that he burned her castle down. The Scottish army debouched to a local hill called Flodden Rise. Surrey was therefore able to make contact, but when he and his commanders saw the Scots, they quickly understood why the fair field offer had been refused. The Scottish position was impregnable, the flanks were steep and protected by marshland, and James had fortified the hill with his guns protected by stakes in deep weapon pits. Surrey's men were outnumbered, the rain was still lashing down, and their supplies were critically low. The wagons carrying the pre-stored provisions at Newcastle had been intercepted by border raiders who had stolen the lot. That night the disastrous news reached Surrey that the beer had run out. If he was to carry out his orders to drive the Scots out of England, it was essential to fight as soon as possible. Desperately, he decided on an early flanking march to get around the Scottish position, possibly with the idea of blocking their lines of communication back into Scotland, which would have forced them either to fight or to retreat. It seemed essential that this move would be undetected, but the Scots soon realised the English were on the move. They quickly broke camp, burning anything that could not be moved, and swung their army eastwards to another piece of high ground called Brankston Hill. The rain had given way to a heavy mist, and combined with the smoke from the burning Scottish camp, the top of the hill was completely hidden from view to the English troops wading across Brankston Stream. The English army was about halfway across when a sudden breeze blew the cover of mist and smoke away, revealing the entire Scottish army drawn up in full battle array on the top of Brankston Hill. Then little puffs of smoke appeared across their front as the cannon opened fire. It is not known exactly how big the Scottish army was at Flodden, but all contemporary accounts agree they had a significant numerical advantage over the English. Some sources claim James had raised some 60,000 men, but this is generally considered an exaggeration, and a figure of about 40,000 is more likely. It is certainly true that the terrible weather had depleted his army considerably, but most authorities agree the Scots still numbered well over 30,000. On the extreme left of the Scottish army was a combined force of borderers, organised as pikemen, under Lord Hume, and a smaller force of Highland clansmen from Aberdeenshire and Invernessshire under Alexander Gordon, the Earl of Huntley. The total came to about 8,000. To their right was a slightly smaller body, about 7,000 strong, consisting of levies from Perth, Angus, Fife and the other North East Lowlands, organised as pikemen and led by the Earl of Crawford. In the centre of the Scottish line was the main battle under James himself. It was some 14,000 strong and consisted of heavily armed and equipped levies from the central lowlands, including contingents from Edinburgh, Eyre and Galloway. On the right flank were about 5,000 Highlanders and Islemen, Campbells, Macleans, Mackenzies, Grants and Macdonalds. There were also contingents from Caithness and the Orkneys. James stationed the French knight Dossey and his men-at-arms with this division, possibly to try and exercise some control over the wild Highland charge. Finally, on the extreme right was a division of about 3,000, supposedly under the command of the Earl of Bothwell, and consisting of pikemen from the Lothians, Ettrick, Gallashiels and Selkirk. They were intended to act as a reserve. The main weapon amongst the lowland troops was the 18-foot pike, a renaissance throwback to the classical armies of Alexander the Great. When used en masse, a pike phalanx was well nigh unstoppable. On mainland Europe, Swiss pikemen had been winning spectacular victories, but it was a clumsy weapon that became useless if the tight pack formations were broken up, and the Scots had not had a lot of time to learn to use it properly. Most of the Highlanders were armed with the traditional bow and claymore. Protective equipment for the Scots was much the same as that worn by the English, but on average the Scots probably had more armour. Acutely aware of the terrifying destructive power of the English longbow Arrowstorm, James made sure that the most heavily armoured of his troops were in the front ranks, and had equipment with large wooden shields called pervises. At this stage, the English force was divided by the stream, the vanguard in extreme danger, with its back to a marsh and without its artillery, which had been forced to detour to cross by Brankston Bridge. But the Scots did not attack immediately. James's military understanding was heavily influenced by axioms, and one of these was that being uphill was an advantage not to be lightly squandered. James obviously intended to force the English to come to him, but they were still waiting for their rear formations to cross the stream. The reprieve, even under cannon fire, gave the English time to redeploy to match the four bodies of Scottish troops. Dacre's right wing of the rearguard was split up, some reinforcing Edmund Howard's vanguard division, but most merging with Surrey's division. Dacre himself, 
with 1,500 border horse, was pulled into reserve. Marmaduke Constable's left wing of the vanguard was merged into the Admiral's division, although some seemed to have been sent off to join Stanley, at the time still moving up to the Brankston stream. As soon as these alterations were complete, the English army advanced out of the Pannonsburn Valley, over the crest and onto the foot of Brankston Hill. Nonetheless, James still refused to come down. However, the English managed to get their guns over the Brankston stream, and the battle devolved into an artillery duel. The Scottish cannon were of considerably larger calibre, but firing downhill proved to be very difficult, as cannon in 1513 had no proper mechanism for accurately depressing the barrel. The English had more guns, better served, and being smaller were easier to reload, and hence fired much quicker. The resulting exchange therefore went very much in favour of the English, except that some shots from the Scottish cannon fell near Dacre's command, panicking some of the Northumbrian border horse, who fled the battle. It is unclear whether these events prompted James to finally give the order to advance down the hill, or whether the tension overcame Huntley and Hume's men on the Scottish left flank. Either is possible. It is never easy to stand and simply get shot at, especially as the Scots could see that the English army was smaller and not fully positioned. Whatever the reason, Huntley and Hume's men charged down the slope at what, coincidentally, was the weakest of the English formations. Most of Edmund Howard's men were from Lancashire and Cheshire, and resented being under the command of a Yorkshire man, particularly one as inexperienced as Edmund Howard. The panic flight of the Northumbrian horse had also badly affected their morale, and the appearance of double their numbers of Scotsmen coming for them behind a wall of pike points was too much. Even before the Scots were halfway towards them, their formations were wavering. In a desperate attempt to rally them, one English captain, a Brian Tunstall of Thurlock, took a morsel of earth as one last communion, and then single-handedly charged the advancing pikemen, managing to kill a Scottish knight before being swamped by the pikes. It was all to no avail. Many of his men fled even before the Scots came into contact. Hume's pikes were to their front, while Huntley's Highlanders swarmed on their flanks, unleashing arrows before charging in with claymores. Christopher Savage rallied the Macclesfield men, and here and there other small groups desperately but vainly struggled to hold the flank. Edmund Howard redeemed himself for the disparagement he received from his command. He fought bravely and defiantly. He was unhorsed three times and his standard captured, but he managed to fight his opponents off until he was rescued by Lord Heron, husband of the same Lady Heron, who had entertained James at Ford Castle. The situation was now critical for the English. Their last division was still on the other side of the Brankston stream, and their right flank had broken. If Hume and Huntley had been able to turn their men inwards, in combination with the continued echelon advance of the other Scottish pike columns, they would have rolled up the entire English line. It was at this point that James gave the order for a general advance, and then dismounted, grabbed a pike and went to the front of his division, personally leading them forward into the attack. James has been much criticised for this action, not least by his own advisers on the day, and it is true that by rushing off to chivalrously fight at the head of his army, he effectively relinquished any chance of directing the battle. But against that, he was leading what was still an essentially feudal state, and definitely a feudal army. He was expected to lead from the front, the loyalty of his vassals depended on him setting an example. Besides, pike-based armies hardly majored on finesse. Once the majestic echelon sweep forward had begun, there was very little else to do. Indeed, given the nature of the fight phalanx, there was very little else that could be done. Surrey, however, had seen the danger, and ordered Dacre's reserve border horse to shore up the right flank. The gallant resistance of, amongst others, the Macclesfield militia, gave Dacre just enough time to arrive and charge into Hume's victorious troops. The English were heavily outnumbered, but they were mounted and the Scots were now disordered. A vicious fight ensued with both sides suffering very heavy casualties. Over a hundred of Dacre's men were killed, but in the end both sides drew off. Both had done well. Hume and Huntley had smashed an entire English division, but Dacre had secured the English right flank. From then on, the opposing troops in this part of the battle maintained an uneasy watching brief. As the rest of the Scots advanced, the massed English longbows swung into action. But, as has been said, James had packed the front round of his pike columns with heavily armoured men with the huge pervised type shields. Some arrows carried through to some of the lesser protected soldiers at the rear, but by and large the longbows had little effect. The mighty pike columns marched on, seemingly unstoppable. However, as the ground levelled out they hit a natural obstacle. The downpour of the last few weeks had waterlogged the ground at the foot of the hill, 
the passage of thousands of tramping heavy armed soldiers quickly turns into mud in places knee deep. This seriously disrupted the cohesion of the Scottish formations, but what really neutralised their impetus was the presence of a small stream running across their front. This was not a big obstacle, it had very small banks, but it broke up the Scottish formations very effectively, all the more so because it was unexpected. Lying as it did in dip in the ground, it was not visible from the initial Scottish positions at the top of the hill. As a result, the smashing effect of the pike phalanx was almost completely lost. The English were pushed back only a short way, but they stood their ground, and in hand-to-hand fighting their bills easily worked past the disrupted wall of pike points. All over the front, Scots discarded their now useless pikes and drew their secondary weapons. But although swords were more manageable, they were outranged by the eight-foot bills, which fell on them with vicious regularity. Crawford's division seemed to have collapsed very quickly, but James's large division fought on desperately for hours. James realised the battle was turning against him, and led a charge towards Surrey's banners, hoping that the death of the English commander would yet win him the day. The Scots got within a spear length of the earl before being driven back. The cannon had failed and the pikes had failed. Slowly the English began to grind James' main pike division down. His last hope now was his Highlander contingent, but as these men advanced, bagpipes blowing, the last English formation, Stanley's, climbed up the hill on their right flank and unleashed several devastating volleys of arrows into them. The Highlanders had only padded armour, or at best chain mail, rather than the plate armour that had protected the pikemen. They were decimated, and seeing their lines wobbling, Stanley ordered his men to charge, and the Highlanders broke and ran immediately. Surrey kept his men in order, and swept them round to the flank and rear of the Scottish pike formations. The Scots were now virtually surrounded and compressed into a tight-packed mass. The carnage was appalling. Surrey had told his army they could expect no quarter, and so should give none, and with the tension of the battle the bloodlust came upon the English. Thousands of Scottish soldiers were cut down, many trying to surrender, Hundreds more lost their footing and literally drowned in the mud, now thickened with human blood. So great was the bloodletting that at the end English soldiers had to remove their shoes, stockings and even trousers so they could get a better grip on the ground. Night alone brought an end to the slaughter. Fun was a smashing Scottish defeat, sometimes called England's Revenge for Bannockburn. Casualties were appalling and particularly heavy amongst the Scottish leaders. Reputedly, every noble family in Scotland lost someone at Flodden. The entire upper echelon of Scottish society, the lawmakers, the administrators, the social and political elite, was wiped out, along with all the many advances that James had made. It was a crippling national disaster. The Great Lament, Flowers of the Forest, commemorates the loss, and indeed is still played in Scotland in times of disaster.